We doing okay? We ready? Rock and roll? Okay. I'm Amy Riggins, and my topic is auditory processing abilities in patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, the stuff I'll be presenting on today is a slice of the research I was part of uh, two summers ago as a T35 intern at the National Center for Rehabilitative Auditory Research. I'm going to skip my outline for the sake of time. I'll just go over a little bit of Parkinson's disease. It's a, the second most common neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's disease. It's typically characterized by tremor, slow movement, postural instability, and muscle rigidity. The actual neuropathy is a degeneration of the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra pars compacta, which is the red dot in the brain slide there. Um, the, the substantia nigra is one of the basal ganglia, which is lower in the brain, um, and its degeneration causes this cascading effect across higher areas like the frontal cortex, which is where we get our pretty prominent motor symptoms. It also causes non-motor symptoms, such as dementia, cognitive, dec cognitive decline, and depression. And we were wondering what the effects of Parkinson's disease are on the auditory system. So, um, okay. Uh, previous studies have found that uh, Parkinson's patients have lower scores in pure tone audiometry, especially in high frequencies. Uh, Lee Wald and colleagues in 2004 found that Parkinson's patients had much long, or significantly longer interaural timing differences than their control uh, counterparts. And then the, the Lopez group in 2014 found that the Parkinson's patients had significantly longer P300 latencies and significantly reduced P300 amplitudes. Uh, it's also important to note, I looked at a lot of neuroscience and neurology uh, studies, as you might imagine, there's quite a few on Parkinson's disease. And even though a lot of their tests would probably, their participants would benefit from being able to hear cognitive qu you know, questions on cognitive questionnaires, that kind of thing, they rarely talk about hearing. Um, my PI, Dr. Fulmer, uh, he, neurology is kind of his, his first area, and he said, yeah, neuroscientists and neurologists, not all, but a lot of them just don't think about hearing. So that's something that is common across studies, and it's an area where we can do more outreach for sure. So our participants, we had 36 Parkinson's disease participants. Um, they are, their average age was 66.6 .6 years. I think the average age of onset of disease is around the age 60. And then it's important to note that the average severity of their disease was mild. And this is pretty common across Parkinson's disease studies. Uh, due to the motor nature, nature of the disease, the ones who can come in to volunteer to be in a study are mobile. And the ones who have more severe disease uh, severity can't come in to volunteer. So most studies have only mild, maybe moderate to disease severity. It's also important to note that on average, I'll just tell you right now, uh, our Parkinson's patients and the control participants, um, there was no difference in their audiometric thresholds. On average, they all had around normal low frequency hearing, sloping to a mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss in the high frequencies, pretty typical for the age group. So that's important to, to think about. This slide is just another uh, way to show you the age. I'm just getting acquainted with how I'm gonna have my graphs look. Uh, the Lopez study, the Lopez group did a cool thing where they separated their uh, groups into a young group, which was 65 and younger, and then an old group, which was older than 65. And I was like, oh, that's cool. So I tried it with our data, and I had a nice uh, stratification of our groups. They had a good number in each group. So in my graphs, the purple color denotes young, and green denotes old. And then solid is our control groups, and then checkered is the Parkinson's. So a green checkered column is the old Parkinson's, solid purples, the young controls, that kind of thing. And I'll go over that again when we see future graphs. We had a pretty comprehensive uh, protocol. We did, did, we did questionnaires, neuropsychological assessments, full audiometric evals, behavioral central auditory processing tests, and then an array of neurophysiologic assessments. Today I'm gonna focus on the behavioral CAP tests. These were our CAP tests. The first six you might recognize, uh, they're clinically used. The seventh one is the SR2 spatial release from masking test developed by Dr. Eric Gallen. Um, 
I'll just tell you right now, the first six, we didn't see any differences between our groups. So uh, I think in the words and noise test, there was one condition when the Parkinson's patients did statistically significant, like worse, but um, I'm gonna focus on the test where we got more interesting results, which is the SR2 spatial release from masking test. I'll go over a little bit about the basis of the test. So spatial release from masking is the improvement of speech intelligibility when the target sound is spatially separated or perceived to be separated from uh, maskers. And that's illustrated here. So on the left, we have our guy. He's listening for his target sound in front of him in quiet. That's the easiest condition. And then in the middle, he is listening for his target sound and their speech maskers co-located in the same location in front of him. And then, and that's the hardest condition. But when we separate the maskers spatially uh, at 45 degree angles, theoretically, through binaural processing, the, his scores should uh, get better. So we're using speech stimuli and speech maskers. And so we vary the intensity of the target uh, sound to change the target to masker ratio. It's very similar to signal to noise ratio. So the lower the ratio, the better the score. These are our raw scores from the uh, co-located condition when it was all at zero degrees azimuth. So uh, again, we have our young controls in the solid purple. They did the best on the test. The young Parkinson's patients did significantly worse than their young control counterparts. They actually did pretty much the same as the old controls and the old Parkinson's patients. So we're seeing the effects of age in that the young controls did better than the uh, old controls. And we're seeing the effects of Parkinson's disease in that the uh, young Parkinson's did worse than the young controls. And then this is our uh, separated condition where the maskers were separated out to the side. And again, the effects are even more clear here. So uh, the young controls did significantly better than the young Parkinson's. They did the best. And then the young Parkinson's patients did uh, about the same as the old controls. The old Parkinson's patients fared the worst. The, so we're, again, we're seeing the effects of Parkinson's disease. The, uh, the Parkinson's groups did worse than the control groups. And then we're see also seeing the effects of age and that the youngs did better than the olds. Some conclusions from this part of the study. Um, again, we did not see any statistically significant audiometric differences between the Parkinson's participants and their age match controls. And the SR2 test revealed statistically significant impairment in the young Parkinson's patient's ability to separate speech from speech maskers. And then all of our results combined with the uh, electrophysiologic measures we did, all of this points to a central auditory processing impairment, which makes sense with the, uh, the pathology the central thing going on there. I'll just talk about a little bit about the limitations of our study. Of course, we'd love to have more volunteers come in, bigger sample size in the future. And then ideally, we'd like to have a larger range of disease severity. The other thing was um, uh, during our questionnaires, we were looking at how did, they, how did Parkinson's patients think about their hearing impairment? Did they notice it more? Did they use more, did less, fewer people use hearing aids, that kind of thing. And there was really no difference. So that's all to say, like the hearing impaired community at large, more outreach needs to be done. They're severely underreported. So that's what I was uh, trying to address this year. Um, I made some uh, outreach materials for uh, Parkinson's patients in particular. I partnered with the Wisconsin chapter of the American Parkinson Disease Association. And so I made some written materials for them. I made a bibliography for professionals. And then I also made a website. I have a screenshot on the next slide of that. Um, the stuff we, I talked about today is an article which has been published as of this morning. It's exciting! They called me Dr. Riggins, and I was like, that's not right, but OK. <laughs> this is just a screenshot from the first part of the website. Uh, I talk about what does an audiologist do uh, what to look for if you have hearing loss, what are the treatments, what to expect in an appointment, and some resources, that kind of thing. The references, um, acknowledgments, uh, the research today, my, my internship was funded by the National Institutes of Health. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Fulmer at the NCRAR for being my PI, and then my capstone committee, thank you, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Hartman, and Jane Elliott. Questions? Dr. Hartman. So um, you said there's no difference in hearing impairment controls and the Parkinson's, but do you have an idea of how many 
Yeah, so the question was, um, there was no difference on average in audiometric thresholds, but how many had hearing loss, is that right? Mm -hmm. I don't remember. I can was let you the know. I think it's most of them. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, like, just across. I think, as I recall, when we did, I have another graph in my many graphs. Um, the, the youngs overall did better than the olds, so we could see some aging effects. Uh, so there's like a clinically significant difference in a couple f frequencies in that respect. But um, overall, it was, they were pretty similar across. I don't remember how many, though. That's the thing. I talked to Dr. Gallon about this, um, and one of the weaknesses of the test is that, um, like most CAP tests, they're designed for people with normal hearing, but when we're testing people who are older, a lot of them have hearing loss. So that is a variable that's really hard to tease out. Um, it's hard to get people to come in who don't have any hearing loss. So, yeah. Not really. I mean, they, they take their medication, hopefully. Um, as the disease progresses, I think their medication actually can sometimes make things even worse. Um, but overall, I think, I think getting just you know, regular hearing loss intervention is a good start. Um, on the website and in my, my bibliography and stuff, there's not a lot about like specific things for people, even with dementia. Like, there's talk a lot, of, a lot about does dementia or dementia and hearing loss cause, you know, is there any causality there? But they don't talk about like how to actually rehabilitate other than they're hard to rehabilitate. Yeah, we know. Um, so like using ITEs or um, in the ear hearing aids, they're easier to take in and out, easier to, you know, that's one of the biggest things I think. Uh, using ALDs is really important too. Sometimes they're just like, I just, we just need it in the nursing home or that kind of thing. Yeah. Other questions? They are, yes. I'm wondering if you uh, or in the <coughs> they were looking at any positive assessment. Yeah, so the question was the spatial release from masking test does have a fairly high cognitive load. And the, the test that Dr. Gallen developed is challenging. Uh, it's very long, too. There's an iPad involved, and they were in an anechoic chamber, which is scary. Mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Mazzarelli was asking if we did any cognitive assessments. We did. And overall, actually, so we were recruiting from both the VA and Oregon, the OHSU, the Health, Uni the Health and Science University. And overall, the Parkinson's patients actually had higher cognition. And we suspect that that's because a lot of them were not VA. And so, like, they just, that's, they just had a higher education level, so we, that probably affected it as well. Um, but overall, I don't think their cognition had been affected a lot by the disease. Victoria? I was just wondering where the facility is located. Is it in Wisconsin? Oh, no, it's in Portland, Oregon. Um, yeah, it's in the, the Portland VA. So as a visiting nurse, what mm -hmm. can I tell the people who take care of Parkinson's patients? Mm -hmm. To do like what are some yeah, suggestions? Right, so that so practical things. Yeah. Um, they're probably going to do even more poorly in noise than people without Parkinson's disease, and people around that age are already having trouble in noise. So try to reduce the amount of background noise in the room. Make sure you're facing them so they can see your lips, so they can get visual cues, and then get their hearing tested because a lot of them just aren't going to know. They it's. A lot of them have so many other things going on with their health. They're just like, I don't need another thing. Um, one study I read, though, actually said that they looked at caregiver burden with hearing aids and dementia patients, I think, and there was no difference. So, like, there wasn't a lot of extra burden once they were properly trained to maintain them. Dr. Fowler. <laughs> Yeah, so there's no, there's very little negative effect on caregiver burden. It's, if anything, it, 
and prove them. Okay, thanks guys.